Anin, Anin, Nindoy, Maganaduk. Hello, my relatives. Binesi Queen Dijin and Kaz Makwa and Dodim. I'm uh, from the White Earth Reservation, which I guess you gathered. Thank you for uh, having me and coming out. Uh, but thank you again for, uh, you know, this and uh, being concerned about these issues. And thanks very much to Trish, who's been working really hard on this issue. I just want to say that. And uh, she, you know, she has a bunch of information on the table. I'm going to refer to it. And I hope you all follow up on it, because it's really important what we're trying to do here. And um, it's very funny you said it. I, I came here without charge. You know, I, uh, I shouldn't tell you all this, but I gave a speech for two dozen eggs last week. Um, if you are a big university, you should probably pay me. But if you're a farmer, you could just give me eggs. Just, just let you know. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> um, so I uh, came out here. I, a lot of you know a little bit about my history, but I feel like we are these people in this moment in time and we're the ones who are here, you know, and as you look around, you got this shot to do something great. You got the shot to keep them from blowing off the top of a mountain, you know, you got a shot to keep them from combusting the planet to oblivion. You got a shot to keep them from opening another bad uranium mine or a gold mine for some jewelry that you don't need, right? Shot to keep, to, to take a dam down in a river. And you got a shot to stop the tar sands. And I feel like um, it's this great spiritual moment where you have the ability to do something great spiritually. And I think that that is worth everything. Because we, um, as humans, are different than the rest of our relatives. And we have different opportunities to do things than our relatives. And they count on us to do things and not to mess more stuff up, you know? So that's what I feel like about this tar sands. You know, a lot of you know a little bit about my history. I spent most of my adult life fighting bad things. Um, you know, I, uh, but I also try to do the right thing, best I can. You know, and that's what I found in my strategy is, is you can always fight the bad guys. You gotta fight the bad guys, you can't quit. Because they got a 50 year plan. Exxon has a 50 year plan, you know, for the tar sands and for all of us. And I would say I probably don't agree with their plan. You know, so if you're going to, unless you are, you know, you have to be prepared for a long haul because these things don't get fixed in 48 minutes when you watch TV, you know, little character development, little solution and we're done. It's not like that. It's long haul, these issues, you know, and uh, if we really want to be about the process of not only self-determination, the process of being the kind of righteous or pono people that we, we can be, then we need to think about that. And we need to be, we need to, we need to sort of step outside of our arena of comfort and do something. And I say that to you knowing that a lot of you probably are involved in a lot of issues, you know, and I'm like you. I, uh, some days I wake up and I'm saying, shh, I sure hope someone's got that one covered. You know what I mean? It's like, cause I cannot do all those battles, you know? And so you're hoping, ooh, I got, you know, or maybe you wake up and you're saying, I, I sure hope that bad idea went away cause that was just a really bad idea. You know, the, you know, the golf course on the spiritual, on the sacred site plan, you know. I hope that someone just decided they couldn't do it. Um, this is one that's not, you know. And sometimes you gotta just keep, keep on it. So a little you know, a little bit about my history, but I'm just gonna say that, um, you know, in the course of my life, I've seen a lot of people say no and say that's enough. And, um, in a lot of ways, you know, we're like that. Um, I, got a, I got an adopted sister, and uh, when I first met her, she's a beautiful woman, you know, I met her, she's a beautiful woman, and she uh, still is stunning. And she, uh, she was in this abusive relationship. And I, <clears throat> I didn't really know that much about it, because I didn't really know her that good. You know, and she seemed good on the outside. And then uh, finally, one day, you know, she, she left that guy. And I said, uh, why'd you leave him? I mean, what made you stop? She said, uh, she said uh, you know, I was putting up my Indian coat hangers on the wall. She said those, you know, those nails, you know? She said, and I realized that I was putting them up really high so that when he slammed my head against the wall, my head wouldn't hit it. She said, and all of a sudden I said, that's enough. And I feel like that's kind of where we're at. Is you live in an abusive society 
We live in a society which abuses us and abuses our relatives and abuses our mother. At some point, you've got to just say, that's enough. You know, and, and, uh, and fight these guys. So, um, you know, I've seen people fight. And she has a good life now, I have to say. She has a fantastic life. Um, but I've seen, uh, you know, when I was young, I remember, you know, we used to fight these uranium mines down in New Mexico, and I didn't know much about it. But what I knew is that you can't see it, can't smell it, can't taste it. Last 10,000 years and kills you. Probably shouldn't take it out of the ground, you know? Probably shouldn't start the mess. But how do you fight the nuclear industry? You know, we did pretty darn good. And they ain't built a new nuclear power plant in this country for 30 years. And why is that? You know? That's because people like us fought. Said, can't put it here. You know? Can't open it up. You know, we in our, in our native communities that were really isolated, not unlike the people in northern Alberta, said, you know, just because you cannot see our face does not mean we don't exist. And does not mean you can do that to us. You know, and so we showed up. We showed up across this country at places. And I feel like that was an important step in my own consciousness as a young woman, saying, you know, uh, we have a right to be heard and, and you should see our face before you make a decision, and in fact, the decision's need, gonna need to be no. Uh, so 30 years, now they're trying to reboot the nuclear industry, I don't know if you notice this, but there's no nuclear reboot on a worldwide scale without massive government subsidy. Because nobody wants to get in there, because they're expensive and they're dangerous, right? Which I was thinking that we might learn that lesson from Japan. <laughs> but there's still some idiots in Congress that are pushing this. I don't want to be tangential, but what I'm saying is, is that you fight these guys, but you gotta keep at it. You know, I've seen, people, I've seen people fight off bad mining projects. I've seen people fight dam projects. James Bay, they fought the first round, no, the second round of James Bay dams. You know, fought them for about six years. New York Power Authority canceled its contracts. Um, they got a down rated in their stocks. I say this because I think that a lot of you know that the longer you fight a project, the more expensive it becomes, right? And the more expensive it becomes in a failing capitalist economy, the better shot you have at winning. I'm just telling you that's just the way it is, right? And so keep that in mind. We don't have the money, but they don't either for the long haul. They do not. And so I saw those, those dams, James Bay, too close. And how you know you won is when they say the project is no longer considered economical. And the New York Times calls you a ragtag band of activists. <laughs> you know, we are like, thank you. You know, because we didn't, they, no one would have bet. You know, I've seen us uh, defeat some nuclear waste dumps. And, uh, but what I have to tell you is what you also know. In the process of the 30 years I've been working on this, we have not changed the system. And so you still got a predator-prey relationship. You got a system that consumes a quarter of the world's oil resources and does not have a plan B, right? We have a mass transit system that would be an embarrassment to Bulgaria and is an embarrassment to this country. You have an interstate highway system uh, that should not exist at that level. Yeah? You have uh, inefficiencies in your energy system from point of production at inefficient power plants, inefficient mines, no accounting for the mess they make, right? To the end, which wastes 57% of the energy in your electrical system. So the finally you get to those light bulbs, those incandescent light bulbs that waste 90% of the power when you put them in. You know what I'm saying? Because you get mostly heat in your afterlight. So you got a system that's set up to profit from overconsumption. There's no encouragement to use less. The corporations make money on using more. That's the way it's set up. And so the predator always comes back for something else. So here I am 30 years later thinking I had a bad deja vu as they try to open a uranium mine on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Where I'm thinking, huh, it's like what, the seventh wonder of the world or something? Should it not be worth something, right? You know? Or you look at this here, the tar sands. I don't have an absolute analysis on how to beat this. 
You know, what I will tell you is what I'm hoping you already know a little bit about. As my colleague Trish, Trish and I met, what, in June last year? We've known each other about a year, and she just really is pushing full on on this, you know? And uh, we knew about the tar sands. We was out in Montana when Trish and I met, but we didn't know much about the heavy haul, right? Nobody did. And it kind of came to light. <laughs> and we said, that's a really, really bad idea. You know, but what I'll tell you about the tar sands, single largest industrial project in world history. Mining an area the size of Lake Superior, taking a pristine ecosystem, the Athabascan River system, and turning it into a toxic cesspool, you know. Um, inefficient. The amount of water being used is uh, they got water permits for larger than Alberta's two major cities, Calgary and Edmonton. As far as I know, they're not making any new water, right? What we got is what the dinosaurs had, probably don't want to squander it and turn it into toxins. That's the level of unaccountability. Tar sand producers burn 600 million cubic feet of natural gas to produce tar sands oil annually. No, daily, excuse me. Enough natural gas to hit three, heat three million homes. So they take, basically, if you're going to call it a clean fossil fuel, the cleanest being, being natural gas, right? To make the dirtiest fuel. And to stick it in our gas tanks, right? CO2 emissions exceed those of 97 nations. Just that project. So you want to combust ourselves to oblivion, that's the project. It's right there. But what happens is what always happens in, in, this, in this continent is that if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Right? And so people do not see what is happening. And so they think, you know, it's not in my backyard. And by the way, I want gas for my tank. And so they justify this, they predicate it on that it is a solution to the issues of peak oil. There's not a solution to the issues of peak oil except for reduction in consumption. There is no oil ferry, there's no carbon sequestration ferry, and there's no nuclear waste ferry. Right? You gotta consume less. So what they wanna do, you know, is, is they realized in this country that Consumption is increasing, not decreasing, because of public policy choices and personal choices. And a system that's set up to transport food 1,500 miles from farmer to table, right? And slather petroleum on it and move stuff around the country that we buy and throw away. I'm saying that you got an inefficient system, right? And they want to keep buttressing that system up rather than dealing with the fact that that is unsustainable. And so that practice requires more intervention and more bad oil. So having consumed half the world's known oil resources, we're at this place where the rest of the oil's out there, but it's down where the deep water horizon was, right? the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, probably some place you don't want to go for the rest of your oil, right? Why? Ecologically, shouldn't happen. Economically, should not happen. Expensive and dangerous. Polar ice caps, that's another fantastic place to go for oil. You know, Conoco is announcing it got 20,000 feet down. You know, isn't that like a Jules Verne movie or something? You know what I'm saying? It's like places you should not go. It's called the deep. Just stay away. You know, they probably don't want to see you in your oil rigs out there. Then there's the oil that is in countries that don't want to give us their oil. You know, last figure I heard is we got a three trillion dollar war. 100 billion a year. You know, let alone the price tag of the vets. Can't afford a second war for oil, right? and it cannot afford the Alberta tar sands. The United States has squandered $200 billion that we could have spent doing good things. Instead, they spent it pretty much on the tar sands, building infrastructure to haul it down investment, right? It is e ecologically and in terms of human impact a disaster. Then in this excellent book, available over there. 
I will refer you to. Check this one out. I thought that the bird people would, like, would be horrified at this. Tar sands exploitation, according to ornithologists, is going to kill a minimum of 6 million and a maximum of 166 million North, South, and Central American birds in two to three decades. Now, someone was asking me last night how many birds the wind turbines were going to kill. I'm pretty sure it's not 166 million. You understand what I'm saying? And why would that be? Because that's where they go nest. And they can't nest up there because it's toxic. Yeah? So it is not as if what happens is unseen. It is absolutely as if what happens affects us all. There are a lot of people fighting this. I don't have the absolute strategy. A lot of people think I got the plan. You know, I'm praying. That's like my big strategy is work hard, pray hard. Everybody knows that about me. Which is not, um, you can't like sell that in a bestseller or something, you know. It's like, uh, try your best and hope for divine intervention. You know, I do believe in that though. You know, I do believe in that. But in saying that, you know, across the continent, there are people trying to fight this thing. There are people on the front lines up there in these communities that are saying no. And they are pretty much got duct tape on their mouths. You know, you got an Alberta government, an entire Canadian government, which is beholden and owned by oil companies. It's kind of like Alaska as a country. Think of it that way, right? You know, the tar sands is their answer to everything America needs. So people are trying to stop it. They're trying to put in two pipelines to expand their production. Excel and Gateway. Gateway is not looking good. That's the one going to Vancouver. Not surprising, there's a lot of opposition to it. The opposition is gaining strength, and that is not pleasing the companies. But it's interesting because the tar sands is billed as America's answer to oil, foreign oil dependency. You know, which there's, I think that they even had a, 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 a big ad in uh, the Kentucky Derby. Is that where it was? Maybe we watched the Kentucky Derby? I, of course, watched it for just a minute. Too bad that girl didn't win. Would have been the first woman, you know, she came in fifth. Anyway, but they had a full, uh, like, whatever it is, multi-million dollar ad? Yeah, on how the tar sands was gonna help America. It's a lot of money in this, yeah? But what they didn't point out was this, is that if you got a pipeline going to Vancouver, BC, that oil's not coming to the US, right? That'd be going someplace else. Has nothing to do with American, stabilizing American domestic oil consumption, right? The other pipeline they're trying to put through is going to Houston. That's also not going to the US. They're trying to get access through the pipelines to foreign markets. And that is not in itself going to solve America's oil problems and cut the price of gas at the pump, which is what they are representing this as. And in fact, the documents that were released at their hearings in Canada on why they needed to expand and why they needed the pipeline said, we need a better price for our oil. Not to reduce the price for Americans, but we want to get a better price and we got a glut in the market right now because we can only get our little tar sands oil so far, right? So there's nothing about expansion of the tar sands that's going to solve the addiction problems of America. And that needs to be debunked, because just like any myth or lie that's repeated, like weapons of mass destruction, right? Just because you keep repeating it doesn't mean it's true. And so just because you keep saying the tar sands is the answer does not mean it's true, because it's not the answer. If that's the answer, what was the question? one might want to ask, right? So, we've been fighting the, the XL, you know, we fought it in Minnesota, crossed two reservations. We did get the ante up to 18 million to cross the reservations, that's as far as we could get, because those tribes both took the money because they needed the money. That's what happened. They went around all the reservations in South Dakota from what I could see because they didn't want to spend another $18 million, right? 
Their latest plan in the, in the XL pipeline, I don't know if you've been watching this, it's in USA Today, was they're trying to cross uh, Nebraska, an imminent domain rancher's land. And it's, it's the, uh, what's the, what's the pipeline? Trans-Canada pipeline. So what I'm trying to wonder is under fair trade, or free trade, how a Canadian corporation can imminent domain a Nebraska farmer's right away. You understand what I'm saying? For their pipeline. Interesting legal dilemma. Worth asking, question on. And the Nebraska ranchers and farmers are a little bit worried because they got a shallow aquifer and Enbridge, one of the same companies that's associated with the pipeline, just had that huge spill in Kalamazoo. So some people don't want their aquifer full of oil, turns out. You know, and it's this level of addiction that needs to be questioned and the price of the oil, you know, that is real. So we've been fighting those pieces, you know, doing our best on that. Um, and then here it's the heavy haul. You know, we became aware of this in June, um, trying to do our best, you know, to, ba to battle them off as it goes. Um, I was out about two months ago at Nez Perce, and they're not too pleased. They got about 60 miles of roadway that's on 12, that 12 goes across their reservation, and those trucks were racked up there. You know, I had the fortune of meeting one of the trucks face to face, 300,000 pounds. It's massive. You know, and I don't know what their plan is to get it on 12. It got racked up, you know, took out, scraped the road, and then I think, didn't they take out the power in like three towns? Yeah, nice move. So, you know, turning the Northwest into an industrial corridor, they said, you know, first 207 trucks, but they got a 50 year plan to move it. And so, if you look at it kind of in the big ecological perspective, if you compare this to the Holocaust in Europe, my analysis would be is this would be like if the essential equipment for the gas chambers was crossing allied territory. It's ecologically the essential equipment to destroy the North. And it's crossing what I would consider to be allied territory. One might want to figure out how to stop it. In order to destroy the North, they need the equipment. The equipment's going to come through the Northwest somehow, unless you can fight them off. So if you keep fighting them, turns out that they're going to have to do something really, 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 really expensive, and they're very depressed about that. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I cry tears every night for Exxon. <laughs> you know, so that's what they're looking at. And in doing that, you know, if they have to move it to either I-90 or down to, what are they saying, Houston? Houston. Houston. That's expensive. And they've got to break down their stuff, which is the, side of the size of the Statue of Liberty on its side. It's like massive, huh? Can't make it under an underpass, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you, know, you, got, you guys got the picture. You cannot make it on the highway system. So they have to break it down into a bunch of pieces and move it, which is very expensive. And then the other thing is, which is the issue that the Nez Perce and the Salish and Kootenai city of Missoula, they just filed a lawsuit to an injunction. Because... Um, you know, although all these laws now restrict, including in Idaho, having passed a new slap suit law, which says if you, if, you, if you as a citizen feel entitled to sue and stop the heavy haul, you have to put up a bond of 5% the value of the load. You know, they passed through the legislation, right? Uh it did pass, but they, they took the, Senate, the Idaho Senate took the teeth out of it that said a judge may impose it, not a judge has to impose it. Right. But it's, it's there. The well, it's good, that, it's good that we didn't, they, 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 he just may impose it. But the intent is clear, you know, is, is that Idaho is clearly behind, the Idaho Department of Transportation is clearly behind the movement. And it's trying to stop people. But, you know, the question that I had, which is a legal question a lot of you are tribal members, is, is that I'm pretty damn sure that that Nez Perce tribe and Salish and Kootenai tribe have different legal issues and jurisdiction issues and rightful questions to ask if they got that much of their tribe transected by a road, right? So they're talking about safety. And if they break it down, I'm just gonna say, and I, I think I've talked to Trish about this, is that if they break these things down at any point, there's requirements and they're not gonna be able to meet them. You know, everything that's movable is supposed to be tied down. First three shipments might be tied down, but I bet you about shipment number six, they'll quit that. You know what I'm saying? 
So you guys are going to keep diligent on us. I don't know if you got the full details on it, but you can write to your you know, congressmen and your senators, but we're asking you to take a look, take a look at it. I don't have an answer. You know, I had a woman, a friend of mine who's uh, Tara Humara. She told me this story which reminded me of the tar sands. Because you're looking at something, um, you know, I mean, I just hung out with you guys for a half hour. If you know a little bit about me, I fought a lot of projects, you know. But this is kind of like fighting a hydra. Is that what it's called? <laughs> you know, you cut off one head and then another one appears. Is that what that thing is called? Right. You know, and so, he got a lot of tentacles. It's amorphous, it shifts, yeah? They got an immense amount of power, it's unclear, and he got a lot of fronts. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, all of them have to keep working. You have to keep pushing. This woman told me this story about how her people who live in the Copper Canyon in Mexico hunt deer for their first ceremony. I don't know if any of you heard this story before, but it really gave me this image. So a young man, those Tarahumaras, those are serious runners, right? They're serious runners, and they, uh, I think that they try to go in the Olympics, but then they want to wear shoes, and they want more shoes, right? They don't wear shoes. It's like, these guys, you don't mess around with these guys, right? So they're down at the bottom of this canyon, which is bigger than the Grand Canyon, and when they do their first hunt of a deer, they chase the deer until the deer's heart explodes. That's what I said. I said, wow, how do you do that, right? <laughs> she told me this interesting story, which reminded me for some reason of the tar sands, and I'm just going to leave this with you, which was, she said, if you know your terrain, basically, if you know your canyon, you know which one's a dead end and which one is not. And so you have your community to organize the hunt. And so, the deer's got two choices at each intersection. You understand what I'm saying? Of a canyon. And they block off one and so it goes another way. And a block off another so it goes another way. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? And in that process, the deer becomes exhausted. And that's how you, as a young man, could chase them down. Is it requires this. And in the end, the deer's heart explodes. Now the tar sands, ExxonMobil, are not a deer. But it is a question of how one is able to defeat the largest industrial project in world history. I don't know the answer. But I know that somehow that communication is essential and that this piece out here, this idea of that the United States didn't even manufacture the DART equipment, right? South Korean barges, South Korean made equipment moving in here to destroy the continent. It needs to be challenged, you know. And while we challenge it, what we need to keep doing is illustrating what the enlightened path looks like. Because I'm pretty sure that Exxon is not enlightened. You know, and the enlightened path you know. You do it out here, but you do it, you know, I mean, people do it in their little island of political correctness to some extent. You know, it is local food, it is renewable energy. It is a reduced petroleum economy. Because there's always going to be another evil project, so long as we keep up this level of consumption. And, you know, so it is, we have the opportunity to make, you know, to make that difference. And I want to encourage you, because you're here, as you have gathered, I live about a thousand miles from here. I come out quite a bit, but uh, you guys got a better shot at this heavy haul than I. So thank you again for your time. Miigwech.